Okay, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to um, our event on Applied AI at Clinical Frontlines. Um, uh, I'm Trisha and I'm the president of the um, HSPH Harvard School of Public Health Alumni Association. Uh, on behalf of us, Harvard School of Public Health Alumni Association and the uh, Harvard Business School Healthcare Alumni Association, we'd like to welcome you um, to this webinar. Uh, we're gonna, this is the second event that we're doing. Uh, the uh, last event, which was called Applied AI in Healthcare is uh, available on YouTube if you're interested, if you haven't seen it already um, and you're interested in watching it and we will share it um, in the um, Q&A either during the talk or later. Um, if you did see that and you're back for a second one, I mean, thank you again um, for joining us. Um, obviously to put this event together has required a fair amount of kind of logistical expertise and we're very grateful to the um, uh, Susan from HBS and uh, David, Marianne, Amelia from HSPH in, in making this happen. Um, uh, would I like to extend apologies on behalf of my colleague Nikki from the um, HBS Alumni Association who has had a travel conflict so can't be with us today but will be with us for future events. Now the purpose of this discussion and the purpose of this whole series of discussions is um, rather than kind of you know in abstract discussing the kind of almost infinite potential of technology, um, which is helpful and it is helpful to start things. Uh, we believe there's um, a lot of value specifically now in um, discussing kind of real lessons learned, what's real rather than just kind of long-term hype. And also bringing together some really remarkable people who are not just practitioners, but incredibly thoughtful and rigorous in the way that they um, uh, think about applying technology and directly experienced in doing so. Um, uh, but also have um, a long-term mission, you know, are really looking to improve healthcare over the longer arc rather than just make something work in two months, three months, six months. And um, to enable you guys to hear from them, because one thing that we have the huge privilege benefit of here is that we, um, oh man, that's, that's bad. It's, um, sorry, I'll turn my phone off in a second as well. It's, um, uh, um, is, is that we get to have these discussions often. Uh, but that's just due to kind of geographical chance. And so we really believe in the available, um, these technologies give us the chance to share that discussion more broadly and bring more people into the conversation, which ultimately is something that we're deeply committed to. So um, without further ado, um, I would like to, we have like um, some remarkable panelists, like they're really, they're uh, not just, as I said, incredible practitioners with incredible story backgrounds, but they're um, incredibly thoughtful and kind and compassionate people as well. So um, one of the other benefits of this um, type of venue, this type of experience, like uh, you'll get to kind of witness that in this in this virtual sense as well. So, okay, so so I, I, rather than kind of, you know, like a florid introduction from me and uh, what I would like to do rather than that is I'll just go around and we'll just do some uh, introductions just through kind of me asking um, a question. So. Uh, maybe um, Titch, if you don't mind if I start with you, because you're first on the, just on the, on the screen list. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do and how you came to be in your current position? Sure, uh, thank you, Trish. And then first of all, um, I, I'd like to you know, say thank you to the Harvard Business School Healthcare Alarm Association and the Harvard Chan uh, School of Public Health for putting this uh, conversation together. I really look forward to the discussion. So I'm currently uh, serving as the chief medical officer for Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, which is a regional Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, health plan in the uh, DC, Maryland, and Northern Virginia uh, area. Uh, and Trish and my path to, to this role has been, you know, very circuitous. It started off in Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe, which is where I'm from, uh, went to medical school there and really went to medical school with a social justice orientation. Uh, I really was trying to figure out how to help a lot of folks get access to affordable, high quality healthcare. And at that time in Southern Africa, HIV was quite at the peak. And uh, you know we just didn't have the resources that were uh, needed to help folks get accessible healthcare. So that led me to uh, you know really wanting to be a player in the public health arena, and uh, led me to the Harvard Chan uh, School of Public Health almost 20 years ago, where I studied uh, nutrition and focused on epidemiology and biostatistics. And uh, 
uh, that background really is what got me more and more interested in data science, AI, machine learning, and everything that we're going to be talking about uh, today. But it quickly dawned upon me that uh, you know the public sector in and of itself alone was not uh, enough, and I became curious on the affordability and sustainability of financing of healthcare systems, and wanted really to understand the financing and the business side of healthcare, and that led me to uh, the Stanford Business, uh, you know, Graduate School of Business, and from then I started gravitating more towards uh, the financing of healthcare and I worked for Humana before joining the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Uh, as a, uh, a clinical background, I'm a family physician by training and I uh, did uh, pretty much full scope uh, family medicine from delivering babies, taking care of kids to palliative care and uh, mostly in academic health systems. So really look forward to the conversation and look forward to uh, the dialogue with uh, all the esteemed colleagues on this panel. Excellent. Thank you, Titch. Welcome. Thank you for thank you for being here. Um, Elaine? Yeah, hi, everyone. Just echoing. Really thrilled to be here. Thanks for including me and excited to hear the discussion. Um, I did my business training at Harvard Business School and my medical training at Harvard Medical School. Um, I'm an internal medicine and primary care trained physician. And my clinical and operational experience is that I used to lead the walk-in urgent care center at Mass General Hospital until I then switched to leading a COVID clinic for a couple of years. And outside of my clinical activities, my main area of focus is in digital health. I'm actually also board certified in a relatively new area of medicine called clinical informatics, which really focuses on technology leadership in medicine. And so in that capacity, I work for our broader health system, which is called Mass General Brigham. Many of you are probably familiar. It's a big employer here that has um, many hospitals, clinics, community physician groups, as well as a payer arm called Always. And so for the system, I have two main roles within digital. One is that I'm the lead for population health management for digital activities. And so I do a lot of work there, scoping out what kinds of solutions we need to support our populations. And the other is that I also sit on our AI and digital innovation venture fund as the clinical member of the leadership team. Um, and prior to these roles, part of what got me into this is actually that I formerly worked with Trishan at a digital startup, health startup called Wellframe, where I was the associate chief medical officer from about C stage through series C before I left for, for COVID roles. Um, but that experience really sparked a lot of my interest in venture and investing and entrepreneurship as well. Amazing. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks so much for joining us. Amazing stuff. Um, all right, uh, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today with all these amazing people. Uh, my name is Lisa Mackey. I'm the Vice President of Worldwide Health and Life Science Commercial Strategy at Microsoft. And like Trishan and Elaine, I share a background in entrepreneurship. I was co-founder and CEO of a startup called PocketDoc, which rewrote all of the administrative transactions under the business side of healthcare and connected to over 500 insurance companies in the US and released those as APIs to drive uh, new patient experiences, uh, new data exchange. Uh, so uh, taking that experience, going deep into uh, the business of health and the infrastructure of healthcare in the US, I returned to Microsoft. I worked there early in the 90s and non-healthcare related uh, businesses. Uh, but we turned to Microsoft to see how we could apply the power and scale of Microsoft technologies to help transform both the infrastructure and the application of these new technologies. Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to the discussion. Uh, last but obviously not least, Felix. And so greetings. Greetings from London. Felix Greaves here. Um, I'm a... Uh, uh, I work, well, I'm a public health physician by training. Uh, I work at an organization called NICE, that's the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which does health technology appraisal and guideline development for the National Health Service in England, a bit of a mouthful. But I'm also uh, an academic based at Imperial College where I spend my time evaluating digital health interventions. Um, and I should add, I'm not speaking on behalf of the government here. This is very definitely sort of with my sort of broader experiences from all of those things. And I came into this from, I, I'm an HSPH alum, had a wonderful time there. Um, I, well, my story is that I was a doctor, uh, a junior doctor on the wards in the NHS, wonderful system, values driven, deeply inefficient in places. And I always used to get really frustrated and angry about the performance of the system. And a, a wise professor took me aside one day and said, you know, there is a discipline 
people like you. And he sent me off to, you know, to get us to a school of public health. Um, and that was the start of a journey bouncing between academia uh, and government uh, and into practice. Um, uh, but my role at the moment is largely around measuring whether uh, uh, particularly interested in digital health. So measuring whether this new digital health technology actually works. We can all see the promise, but does it work in practice? Is it cost effective in practice? And building up and developing the um, the, the mechanisms and the, uh, the techniques to, to, to measure that at scale, but also in usable ways. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. It's really interesting. Something that like everyone has said, right, which I'm sure lots of people in the audience are experiencing as well, is that you know, people have taken very different journeys and all incredibly um, impressive, of course. But um, there's like a common seed, which is that like there's something you really care about that you experience doing and think, surely this doesn't need to be done this way and it can be done in some way better. And then there's a journey of finding out how, what that way of doing it better is. And, you know, I really feel at that point, that's where the kind of magic of technology comes in, because like, like technology by itself without that journey is, is basically pointless. It's, it's never going to work. It, like it requires people who really care about a problem, who have you know, viscerally experienced the consequences of it not being done well, really are committed to it being done better, and then um, work in taking new ways of doing things and making them work in the context applicable. So it's really cool to hear, um, to hear all of that. And I think that's kind of that journey, that uh, the second half of that, if you will, is really what this... Um, what this discussion is about. So um, with that in mind, um, I'd like to say, you know, maybe um, Lisa, if you don't mind, if we could start with you and just ask about, uh, obviously uh, you, you have an incredibly broad portfolio, but specifically with respect to the machine learning or AI based technologies in healthcare, would you be able to share a little bit about, you know, what your experience is of uh, developing these technologies and partnering with um, clinical organizations to implement them? Yeah, thank you. I'd be happy to. Uh, of course, I'll be remiss if I don't talk first um, and at length about our recent acquisition of Nuance, because that is very much about taking the technologies that Microsoft has worked on, uh, all the power of machine learning and AI, and being able to apply it at the point of care, you know, in, in the midst of the patient, physician experience, patient clinician experience. And I think I'll take a step back and it, I was looking at a recent survey to say over 60% of the applications of AI in the clinical uh, realm are still primarily operational for operational efficiency. And I think we, we all have to admit we're still fairly early on this journey. And one of the reasons why, as I mentioned at the top of the call, that I wanted to come back to Microsoft is my experience in working as a startup in uh, data exchange for uh, the purpose of setting up infrastructure and being able to do deep analytics, machine learning and AI taught me that we have a lot of work to do and transformation absolutely starts at uh, the lowest level of infrastructure working our way up to applications like Nuance. And you cannot have one without the other. But uh, just very practically speaking, uh, putting a lot of technology in it, something we had uh, contributed to Nuance as a partner prior to the acquisition was just uh, speech to structured clinical notes uh, and being able to take some of the burden of that process off of the clinician um, in no way. And it hopefully, um, and this is what we're seeing and, and Nuance certainly can validate this, allowing the physician more time to attend to the patient and focus you know, in, in the session. Uh, increasingly over time with COVID, applying those same technologies for conversational bots to be able to triage more effectively at the front end of the call and ensure that we're using our clinicians for only the most serious interactions. Uh, as more of our partners and, our, and uh, the health systems we engage with have had to move to virtual care. And I think um, particularly over the last two years, uh, the other areas that we're investing in, you know, call center, case management, um, how can we assist to drive more of these, um, uh, even uh, as well as remote care monitoring, how can we give our clinician customers and organizations more tools and more composable tools to be used more flexibly as we go forward and meet some of these new challenges. 
Um, thank you so much, Lisa. And just a, a follow-up question uh, for you. Like, you know, this is like very much your approach here is 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 partnership focused, right? Rather than you develop technology and it's kind of self-service or throw it over the fence and then the clinical organizations get on with it. Is that is that correct? That's right. So you'll see us invest a lot in understanding um, and and ultimately starting out with uh, partners like Nuance. While we did acquire Nuance, that was uh, for the purpose of being able to understand more of what our customers and partners need from us at the point of care, how to take uh, these foundational technologies like uh, large training sets, models, machine learning, AI at the point of care. Nuance has taught a lot, us a lot about that and building those as services into the platform so that they accelerate our partners and customers in building their own solutions. So you will see us do that. It's not our, our aim or our goal to compete with our partners or our customers. It's, it's to accelerate uh, development. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, there's a, a few kind of, there's a ton of points there that I wanted to kind of talk more about, but um, I think one that I think kind of, you know, just, brings the group together as well, is that, so um, Elaine Titch, I, you know, I guess, you know, you have some deep expertise here in on being on the other side of the table of that partnership discussion that Lisa is uh, discussing. I mean, when you guys are looking at either use cases for AI based technologies and or partners that you'll be looking to work with, what is it that you're looking for? How much of it is the technology? How much of it is that you feel these are like, these human beings are collaborative partners who you can do like co-discovery or like co-implementation um, together? Um, I don't know, um, Elaine, would you like to go first or is that okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I would say that the team is most important to us. We're definitely looking first and foremost to have people that we feel will be good partners and who have a shared mission with us and that we can be complementary to one another. I think that a lot of the things that Lisa already called out as far as subject matter areas and what kinds of technology we're looking for are completely on point with how we're thinking about things too. Um, some of the big areas I'll call out that we're interested in are getting better at segmenting our patients and identifying who's going to benefit from intervention. We obviously do a bit of this, but being able to be more proactive about it, more nuanced about it, combining different data sources is huge. And also a corollary of that is equity and access to these things. And how do we not just maintain what we have now, but improve it, which I think as we speak a bit more throughout this session is one of the big concerns around AI and these technologies in general, right? Is yeah. how can we make sure that we're actually improving that situation with anything new that we add on? Um, yeah. The other big forces I'll call out are alleviating staff burden and capacity management or anything that can help with workforce shortage. That is one of the new biggest emerging struggles for us on the front lines. And so anything that people are putting in front of us that can speak to those things is going to get our attention. Um, and I should just add that as far as where I sit in this process, I'm very much at the implementation, um, matching our business needs and strategic needs to the technology more so than on the research side. But as, as we talk about our organization and how we think about technology, there is a research arm. We are building internal tools. And again, also, as Lisa said, we're not looking to be competitive in who we partner with. We're really looking to be complementary. So that's the other thing that we're looking for in a technology is that it is something new and different than what we have internally, where that technology will help us out, but also ideally that we can support that partner and their success with the resources and infrastructure that we have within our system as well. Yeah, that's wonderful, Elaine. Um, there's there's a few things I'd like to kind of double click on there as well, but I guess this is it's great. Honestly, it's kind of very uh, rewarding for me. I can see the different connections between people here. So um, so, so if you wouldn't mind, I'll just kind of go forward in, in, in that spirit. So the things that you mentioned there around, you know, being cognizant not just of the absolute level of gains but their but their distribution and, and particularly their their fair distribution um and this is i know is something that titch uh, thinks about a lot and where he's brought a lot of leadership to his organization and within a much broader strategic envelope of looking at these things um so titch yeah when you're kind of looking for technology partners um what are you looking for and why i, I imagine there's a lot of similar stuff there right yeah, uh, yeah, Tristan, I was going to say the same uh, thing. Uh, there are a lot of similarities. So just uh, like Elaine, we do look at the team. Uh, I think we have to be strategically aligned 
both in mission and value. And like you uh, absolutely said, you know, uh, one of the, the four buckets that we look at uh, for us when we look at technology is how does it impact access to care? How does that impact quality of care? How does that impact uh, affordability or sustainability of the funding uh, for that technology? And then the last uh, that you mentioned is we we'll look at it from an equity perspective. If that technology is only available to a certain group of people and is not available to all of our slash membership or patients, then we kind of you know think twice uh, about it before we can uh, engage our partners. The other piece that we look at, uh, Trishan, is a really good understanding of the healthcare industry and all the different stakeholders that are you know, part of the healthcare ecosystem here in the United States. So for us, um, we can't help our members or patients without our providers. So help understanding what the physicians need, what the healthcare system need, uh, so that we're not um, you know, creating unnecessary what we would call provider abrasion is one thing that is super important for us. The second piece is understanding the needs of the members slash patients, depending on how you're looking at it. That being said, there are other stakeholders that are important to us, which are the government and the employers. So to the extent that our partners understand all of these, I think uh, we would be in a very good good place to begin to have a conversation. Then we can you know, start talking about the technology and the solution itself, which could be either, um, like Lisa said, from an operational efficiency standpoint, or it could be more from a direct clinical impact standpoint. And depending on, you know, what it is that we're looking at. Then we have conversations about, okay, what do we have in terms of infrastructure and capability internally? And then what do we need to buy? What do we need to build? And what do we need to enhance or complement what we have in-house? Wonderful, thank you, Tich. It's um, uh, just a, a quick follow on from question for you before I go, go to Felix. Um, you know, like, I mean, if, if I could ask you to speculate, uh, you know, when you're looking at, uh, a new solution say right and and you have you're kind of vetting the importance of the uniqueness of the technology versus these elements of like the team and them being like collaborative partners are do you weight these things 50 50 is it like you know like what's the what's the relative importance of each and why yeah i can jump in first uh you know Trishan. i think uh, so for us, um, you know, just knowing what we're talking about needs a lot of uh, capital investment and a lot of uh, infrastructure and capabilities for us to um, really execute. And so we are looking for long-term uh, strategic partnerships. And if we're looking for long-term strategic partnerships, really it goes back to not only the team as far as who are the individuals we will be interacting with. Sometimes it actually goes to the broader culture of the organization that we're working with because the culture of that organization is not gonna change uh, you know, based on the individuals who are working on a specific project. So uh, it, it becomes you know, extremely, extremely important because it's one of the biggest drivers of, uh, of our success. So. You know, if I were to speculate, I probably would say that would be, you know, a significant uh, piece. Technology, as we all know, right, there are a lot of competitors out there who are coming in with, you know, different technologies that may or may not be the same, but um, it's something that could be, you know, oversimplifying here, replicable. Yes. The culture and the team is kind of hard to uh, really uh, replicate in a short period of time. This is an incredibly important point. I mean, Elaine, would you mind if I bounce that back to you? Like, what do you think? No, I agree. The, the team itself is its own moat, right? If you have a very solid team and leadership, it's, it's difficult for other companies to emulate that. And I think also looking at when companies get into trouble or when funding is hard, what's going to get them through is, yeah, in part the technology, but a lot of that is the makeup of the team and their dedication to it. So I, I agree with what's been said. Um, are there like, you know, when you talk about team, are there like specific functions that you need to see to like feel confident? Like, how do you know if someone's going to be a good partner? I guess that's, that's really what I'm trying to ask. 
Yeah, I think that is dependent on the stage of the, the company or the product itself and how far along they are. Oftentimes in my capacity, we're looking at smaller companies where it's really a couple of people. Um, and so you're looking realistically at the CEO and maybe one other high level leader there. Um, but as companies progress, then I think you are, you're looking dependent on that product to see that they're able to recruit and retain people who are high quality for the functions they need for that stage. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Excellent. Tich, is that kind of how you, is that, is that similar to your calculus as well? Yeah, I would say uh, the same thing. I mean, you know, typically we do have, you know, all of these scoring frameworks that we use, right? And a lot of folks are involved in the decision-making process within the organization. That being said, Tricia, um, the emotional aspect of it is also, uh, I can't, uh, it's hard, it's intangible, but yeah. there is really something about, you know, the feeling that you get when you're talking to that leader who's yeah. you know, coming with the solution that in some ways ends up, you know, <laughs> affecting the scoring, but I think it's an important part of it that a lot of folks, uh, you know, don't actually uh, think about when we are having these conversations and partnerships. Yeah, it's a very important point. And I'm really glad you mentioned it. And I guess, you know, it speaks to the thing about, you know, practically speaking, these technologies, uh, A, take a long time to implement, B, the path is uncertain, and C, the organization, you guys, are making a significant investment yourselves. And so therefore, given those three parameters, you just want to feel a sense of belief in the people that you're doing this with. That entirely makes sense. Um, okay, like shifting gears, Felix. So Felix is, you know, your calculus is, is significantly different here, of course, because it's, you're very different. Like, so you are the government stakeholder. I know you're based in the UK, but uh, obviously you're connected to and your experience has commonalities um, across many developed um, uh, uh, economies. So um, yeah, like, could you take us through at a high level? I know it's kind of, you know, is, is, a, is a large amount of territory, like how these, how, how you're approaching evaluating these technologies and, um, how they come to you and what kind of recommendations you're able to make. Is it focused on safety, efficacy, cost effectiveness, or three? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, just um, let us know what you think. Absolutely. And well, so let's start with some top level, just the, the process, but then some of the, the particular sort of well, things we have to think about in this new emerging space. So um, as with all all um, countries, we there there is a, a proper regulatory agency, that does the, the hard regulation, the FDA equivalent in probably the jurisdiction of most people on this call, um, so the MHRA or the EMA in Europe or the UK. And they're the people that look out for safety in particular. You know, are there any... Uh, Sort of do that that classic safety role and to an extent effectiveness the, the role that my organization does for the country is to look to see okay does it work how well does it work how does it move patient outcomes and is it cost cost effective on the technical process of, of working out sort of um sort of a cost per quality in the uk system we, we literally do put a, a, a price um on the unit of, uh, of life we're willing to pay for and that allows us to to calibrate and judge and, and pick and, and and work out and haggle if we're honest um, around drug prices and, and we've become very good at that and um, we have very well established process of working with life sciences and um, um so we look at all the drugs we look at all the new drugs coming down and we look at the um, the new major indications and there's about a hundred of them a year a hundred of them a year is manageable it keeps us busy we have a machine to do it um but then you look at the ai technologies so if you look at the the, um, the fda numbers on this in 2015 uh, like in the 10 years up to that they're doing a handful of them a year literally you know five six something like that and then five years later they're doing a hundred and the growth curve looks horribly like an exponential function to me. I mean, it's brilliant because it shows creativity, innovation, all of those things going on and, and going on, you know, at grand scale. But if you're the, if you're the regulator or the quasi-regulatory function like I am, this is a big headache because I, I, I don't speak for all the regulators internationally, but I'm pretty sure none of them have an exponentially increasing um, budget. So we've got to work out how to deal with this. And and it is really it is really quite hard. And, and most of the regulators and most of the people doing this health technology process that we do are trying to land in some version of proportionality. Okay, how do we get it right? So we're putting the right level of scrutiny on the right level of risk. You know, if you're doing diagnosis or treatment, we want to put it up there and put some pretty high standards there. If you're trying to make things more efficient with less sort of less obvious risk, sort of, uh, sort of managerial admin tasks, if it's about, you know, just uh, sort of a simple patient interaction, let's, let's, let's not go that far. Let's, let's, let's be proportionate. And also let's give people a 
confidence interval to sort of work within as a, as a company. We say, well, do this, because these things change as well. A drug's a drug, it's a molecule, it's stable. Algorithms, they present so many technical, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, so some of them change fast, some of them sort of some slowly, there's some in a way that you can see, others it's all a way that's not too hard to see. So there's a whole load of these additional technical questions. And we've been working out, so at the moment we're sort of running flat out and trying to keep up, and we're just about there. But it's going to get, it's going to get busier. And almost all regulators these days want to be enabling. They want to support innovation. We're not, we definitely don't want to be there to, to squash it. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have a, a duty to both, you know, for, for the safety of the public, but also the, in our case, the, the national accounts to make sure we're doing a good job. So, so we've got to balance these things up. And if I'm honest, we're all looking around at the moment thinking, how, how can we do this at greater scale, more uh, sort of a faster, quicker, how can we put sort of boundaries of uncertainty so you can work within this boundary of uncertainty, but make sure we've got the right data collection mechanisms to do effectively, you know, some sort of you know, uh, upgrade of post-market surveillance so we can put it out maybe at an earlier stage and then keep tracking the effectiveness of a new technology. We're really interested in those things that we've described around sort of um, uh, variation around uh, inequalities, disparities, depending on the language of your health system. We, uh, we're very aware of the fact these, these technologies tend to be developed with white uh, unrepresentative data sets, certainly the UK population. And, and yeah, it's not that we're jumpy about that, but we do want to make sure that whatever systems we put in place can take account of that, can learn from that, be constantly sort of vigilant to see whether things are performing as, as we expect. So like regulators, we, we're normally defined by statute. We normally have a task that we have to do, and we were designed to evaluate something that doesn't look anything like an algorithm. I mean, who calls, who, who's got a dose of an algorithm? It's, it's actually really quite hard to tell. So we're all trying to catch up. Uh, you can see it with the great work the FDA are doing, um, it's sort of the equivalent work in Europe and, and, and UK to try and think about how to do this. So my, I suppose, while you're creating these partnerships that you described, these fascinating, you know, the brilliant combinations between the health system provider, the technology companies, my plea is, Talk to the regulator. Talk early, and kind of regulators are humans too. In the same way that having that that confidence of the team that you're working with, we're trying to work this out. We're looking for that case study. Obviously, we're going to put you through the same standard. We're going to be, you know, robust and follow process because that's what we do. But if we can build those personal sort of relationships with people and understand what's going on, see it from their sort of problem, we really want to learn and understand how we can do this better, more effectively, and faster. That's my start of ten. Uh, outstanding. Thank, um, thanks, Felix. So, so I guess, well, you heard it, heard it here first, folks. But like, it's, um, well, I guess that's actually not strictly true. So, so, so Felix and I have published a paper on this. I can't exactly remember the title. Um, a distributed approach to the regulation of. I'll just put a link in the chat. Great. Okay. Cool. So, um, so there's a link in the um, in the chat. It's open access. Um, uh, Amelia, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with a broader group, that would be great um uh but yeah we kind of go into this in, in even more detail we think it's a very important point um um okay so um actually so i'd like to kind of move on a little bit actually to, uh, to go back to lisa and um to take something that um is from a discussion that we had uh last month so 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 lisa is part of the faculty as is as is uh, has a felix and titch as well and elaine i hope i can coerce you into doing it as well, um, of our course, Applied AI in Healthcare, um, which we'll share the link of that as well um, here at Harvard School of Public Health. And um, we were having a discussion. Uh, it's actually very much in the spirit of what, of what uh, Lisa brought up with respect to this massive acceleration in large language models, which, you know, over the last few years is probably the area of machine learning AI research where you've just seen, um, you know, the, the so, so this whole field kind of started where like there was benchmarks on an image recognition task like classifying is this a cat or a dog or a donkey or whatever it is uh, from from a for, uh, from a picture and like those benchmarks that have been held for some time were shattered and then the same thing happened in in game playing and i think you all know kind of what these examples are and then over the last three four years especially the uh, benchmarks in the size of the models and then also their performance and the kind of tasks that they can take on have been uh, radically rethought um, and organizations 
such as Microsoft have been key in this, Google um, as well. The large technology companies have made significant um, investments in these areas because there's a huge cost in uh, bringing the, the, these data sets together. Some of them are eff effectively trained on all text on the internet, uh, uh, effectively. Um, but, but these technologies are now um, much more mature. And, and on the course, we had this discussion with Lisa and a fellow uh, technology leader from Google um, uh, separately, but it was the same conversation. So I just wanted to kind of bring it up here. And that's that like, so, you know, th th three of us here are in primary care. And um, if you think about like some of the areas of friction, we talked about like, you know, one of the purposes of technology is to remove friction is to exactly as Lisa says, to enable clinicians to do what they do best. Uh, emotional relationships, uh, complicated problem solving, um, speaking to people directly. Um, uh, uh, and, and if you look at primary care, if you look at today, everywhere in the world, the like primary care consultation, um, it hasn't really been that affected by those technologies yet, right? And like, you know, if you look, there's still like a burden, the patient needs to remember all the stuff that's happened to them in the last few months, why it reached a threshold where they think, actually, you know, I should go and see someone about this. Uh, then packaging the story in a way that communicates it to people such as us that like, ah, this is something that's valid that, uh, and by valid, I mean, that has like clinical acuity that, you know, is fits a kind of model of the world that doctors understand and, and can help with. And then the clinician has to document that and figure out what to do and instigate a process of in investigation and management. Now, the discussion that we had was that the technologies to automate that are already available they're already mature. Like they're already like gone through all the R&D process and um, basically they're ready. And organizations like Microsoft have a number of different offerings in this area. Lisa mentioned uh, Nuance, and there's many others within the family and other large technology companies, Google, uh, Amazon also have, have, um, have similar things. And then a, a bunch of smaller organizations as well. Um, but we don't see these at the clinical front lines yet. So I guess well, what I'd like to ask is why? Um, like, why is that the case? Like, and, and is there anything that can be done about it? Is there, are we reaching some inflection point where things are suddenly gonna shift? Um, yeah, so I'd like to, I don't know who, who would like to take that first. I don't wanna put anyone on the spot if you don't wanna kind of be on the spot. So uh, would one of you like to kind of volunteer to jump in uh, with that? Yeah, Trisha and I can uh, jump in first. Um, so, you know, I look back to, you know, the days when I was in, you know, primary care, um, seeing patients every 15 minutes and uh, every day. Um, and I think there's something about not only the technology, but also about that human to human interaction that is important um, in the patient doctor uh, relationship. And as I think about, you know, the, the use of technology, some of the conversations that I've heard are, you know, geared towards replacing that uh, sort of, you know, like human interaction. And I, I, and I struggle with this because I'm not sure uh, that that's what the patients want or that's what the doctors, you know, want either. Um, so as I think about it, uh, part of it is the messaging, right? You know, the, the technology is not replacing uh, that relationship as much as it is enabling for that uh, relationship to be more efficient and um and, 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 you know, really enabling the doctors to spend more time uh, with, um, with their patients. So I see that as one uh, sort of uh, like big barrier. The other barrier that I, you know, that I think about is um, at a very high level, when we think about all the problems that we see in healthcare, um, I think a lot of, uh, you know, folks, you know, struggle to believe that just, bringing the technology is going to solve all the problems that we have. So I, it, it's almost like, um, you know, a, a bread and butter issue, you know, when you think of, you know, the, the hierarchy of needs uh, mm -hmm. from a healthcare standpoint. I look back from, you know, where I was born and raised in Zimbabwe and, uh, you know, 
in the hospitals, there are the huge fundamental problems that need to be taken care of before we even start uh, yeah. you know, thinking of technology. And that's not unique to Zimbabwe. It's also here in Baltimore, where I live. Uh, and you know, th there are a lot of huge uh, fundamental problems that we haven't solved for in the healthcare industry uh, that I believe that um, technology will be part of the solution, but it's not the only solution. So, and I know, you know, for, for, for conversations like this, uh, a lot of us, you know, because that's what we do technology every day, right? We, we, we think that if we just, you know, go and land technology in the piece of, uh, in, you know, in the labs of providers and health systems, they're just going to quickly adopt them and uh, solve for all the problems. And yet uh, that might not be necessarily the case. Uh, th th those are sort of, you know, like my initial thoughts uh, as, as I reflect on why technology hasn't mm -hmm. been, uh, you know, uptaken as quickly as we, uh, as we would like it to be. Thank you, Tish. A lot of very important points there. Um, Elaine, I'd love to know what you think. Yeah, I, I think where we're ready and are going to see more adoption shortly is what everyone's called out as the less, less clinical, less high risk scenarios where you're not diagnosing something for a patient where there's just a much higher level of trust that's needed. I think around scheduling basic triage, again, things like capacity management, those more administrative tasks, we are ready to implement and are starting to do more. I think part of what's going into us not doing the same on the clinical front does come down to trust issues. Um, I know that many of you have probably heard of this black box idea, right? Like with an algorithm, as Felix said, it's not a drug. We are used to being able to say we tested a static thing and now we're going to expect that it performs the same over here. Um, but when you have newer AI technologies where you can't necessarily explain why a certain individual input gave you an individual output, there's this black box in the middle, we don't really have a framework or comfort level with trusting those sorts of things yet, especially for clinical care. So I think that is a part of it. Um, I think the other, as, as Titch was talking about these foundational issues we need to sort, um, one example of that here that comes to mind for me is remote patient monitoring. Of course, we're very interested in all of the sophisticated ways that you can deal with this data and interpret it, et cetera, but realistically, we haven't figured out how to ensure equitable connectivity access for patients, how to get them the devices, how to manage the devices. And so we have this huge onboarding challenge that's gonna hamstring anything we do further downstream as far as really sophisticated use of that data. So it doesn't mean we're not looking there, but I do think it becomes a case of competing priorities and where you're going to invest in first when you look at the bigger picture of how you're going to have the most impact. Thank you, Elaine. Um, yeah, so Lisa, I imagine these are conversations that uh, are obviously familiar and you, you, you come across a lot in working with your partners. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts in so far as you're able to share them. Uh, of how uh, these uh, absolutely. As Elaine was speaking, I was thinking yesterday I spent time with my 95 year old mother and thinking about uh, remote care monitoring and, and management, even in that population uh, with individuals who are challenged to operate a mobile phone, much less interact with devices to share sufficient information uh, to be able to monitor them at home. You know, and even ambient devices get knocked off and then can't be re reattached. It's, there's a lot of very practical issues that need to be solved. Um, so I, I hear that. And, and I also deeply hear the trust issue uh, Microsoft has invested quite a bit. It's a five-year initiative, AI for Health, which is uh, has no commercial requirements. It's purely to be able to contribute data scientists and, and investment grants to projects that will allow us to learn more um, and also make a, a commitment to transparent AI and, and how we can better educate and demonstrate the the impact of these technologies and build trust uh, over time. So it's, it's something that Microsoft definitely hears across industries, but particularly in regulated industries like healthcare where risks and responsibilities are so high and is, is taking that approach. Um, and I think also, and this comes from my own entrepreneurial experience of, of introducing modern approaches to data exchange, uh, there are business uh, issues and business alignment issues that can also 
need to be in, in our UK partner now is laughing, uh, that <laughs> potentially need to be addressed. They're, they're real, they're important. Uh, they also have to be solved for. Not everything is a technical problem, as I often find myself explaining to my colleagues at Microsoft, you know, our business is solving hard technical problems, but we must align them to business incentives and business needs. So that's the other one that I would bring up. That's absolutely key. And that's, and that's why we're here, right? That's why we have the business school, School of Public Health. I mean, I think, I hope you're all convinced in the audience that there is like a very clear intersection here and the art of making these technologies work, realizing their promise, avoiding their perils is in kind of navigating this space. Um, so that's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, okay, so we're going to move over to some questions from the audience. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them because there's a lot. But um, uh, I think I'm going to basically pick some. And if I don't, if you don't mind, I'll just ask them. And then it's kind of open season, I suppose, just um, if one of you could jump in. So um, there's some that we can address later. So I'll, I'll skip over those. Um, uh, Okay, so we've got um, uh, a, a question here. What is the percentage mix of internally driven innovation and prototyping testing of new ideas versus externally or partner driven innovation? What is the biggest technology barrier to adoption improvements and changes in the healthcare system? So maybe we, if we just take the first part of that question um, and maybe Elaine Titch, if we could start with one of you. Um, what is the percentage mix of internally driven um, innovation uh, versus uh, looking to partners? So from our perspective, we don't necessarily have a percentage benchmark, and I think it's going to vary by organization. Ours is one that is really invested in research, so we do have a higher percentage of internally generated uh, wow. innovations than maybe many others that don't have that research budget or commitment. Um, that being said, Part of the reason that the fund that I now sit on was created, and it was just created uh, um, right at the start of the pandemic actually, was to increase the amount of partnership alignment that we could provide with external companies by also being an investor. So I think we do have renewed focus in that area, but again, we don't have a target. It's really case by case. Does it make sense based on what we're good at for us to be the ones who make this versus does it really make sense to, to partner with this? someone who's got more capability and depth of expertise and resources in that particular area than we do. Um, and just to the second part of that, as far as biggest barriers for us, especially right at this moment, I saw another question in chat around change management. It's really in many cases, just staff burnout, exhaustion, competing priorities. And so I do think that that's one of the areas where I've seen not just in our organization, but across the board, where we often underinvest and under focus that is then the main determination of the success of the technology. So just wanted to sneak that in there because I do think that's incredibly important to consider. Thanks, Elaine, that's an important point. And sorry, I didn't see that question, but, 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 but they fit together very well. Um, Tich? Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing uh, as Elaine. Uh, we really don't have any you know, benchmarks and uh, you know, it's also not static. It's uh, different for different departments. It's contextual. It depends on you know what's happening in the macro environment. Uh, there may be some solutions that are you know coming up pretty quickly. Then we gotta pretty you know must be agile and adopt those as quickly as we can. And then sometimes there are just things that pop up in the market uh, from a problem standpoint that we gotta you know solve for as quickly as possible. And that really. Um, almost like forces us to invest as much as we can because it's a it's a unique problem that is urgent and that needs to be solved for uh, pretty quickly. And then uh, from an adoption standpoint, um, yeah, Elaine mentioned change management. The other factor that I would add is just behavior change, uh, both um, you know on the member side or patient side, as well as even on the provider side, and then even on the associate or employee level side for for folks who are using those technology. When I'm thinking about you know just behavioral change in in patients uh, or just in people in general. It is just so hard, regardless of how much technology we throw at them, right, for folks to really change their behavior. And it takes time. Um, and we haven't quite, you know, figured it out in the industry really to 
help people go through behavioral change in a way that allows them to adopt the behaviors that are good for you know better health outcomes and you know it, it becomes a combination of not only the technology right it's the sociology it's the psychology it's the politics it's the landscape there are there's just so many uh facets that need to all fall in place for, for that adoption to, to work. Other times it works and we have no idea how it worked, but we're glad it does. Uh, and then other times we you know, try as hard as we can and we still don't, can't, can't figure it out. And, and uh, uh, Lisa, thanks Ish. I, I think Lisa also, I guess the line between internal and external is, is actually not so distinct as it was. I, I imagine you do a lot of kind of co-development um, with large healthcare organizations as well, um, as well right? You have like significant R&D resources and huge infrastructure. And we do, we do. We, we uh, particularly on the research side of Microsoft engage in multi-year projects uh, with large organizations, care delivery organizations, uh, pharmaceutical companies to understand how to apply these technologies. Because we, while we do employ clinicians, um, physicians, nurses, administrators, uh, people with a uh, life science background, so we can approach the conversation with a shared understanding of, of the industry. We aren't, uh, we aren't in the business of being cl clinicians. That's not, uh, we want to help our customers and partners do that. That's not our job. And, um, and we understand that those on the front lines are going to be able to uh, inform and adapt uh, these technologies much faster and with immediate knowledge in ways that we cannot. So that that's our objective. Uh, but back to Tisha's comment about behavioral change, I just want to comment on that because I, having made uh, software my entire professional life now, which <laughs> which increasingly is for a very long time that I can't quite wrap my head around, um, we've always attempted to change human behavior. And to your point, it's the hardest thing to do. And I think even one of the hard things for us to accept in, in such an important uh, and well-intentioned industry like healthcare to try to save lives, something so serious, human behavior is often driven by things that don't feel as serious and that we have to embrace if we're going to motivate populations to, to do the right thing, whether it's, um, um, and I think that it, it gets to some conversations we we're having earlier on, but I just want to, I've been trying to get people to click on buttons and do behaviors in technology my whole life. And often it comes down to, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but sex, drugs, and rock and roll are really what people get excited about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, just to build on that, I, 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 and what we've been hearing a lot on this, on, on this panel is, you know, if, the technology technology is hard you know doing machine learning technology is hard and there's brilliant companies doing it but one of the reasons it's been so hard in healthcare um is it, it's not it's not so much about the technology it's all about the things that wrap around it it's about the people the people inside the service who at the moment are all burnt out the public outside who are you know excited but pretty scared and distrustful in some ways about these things and, and, and we're gonna have to take them on a journey it's not gonna be fully automated diagnosis it's gonna be diagnosis supporting a clinician doing it. I think at first, and we've got to take this baby step, absolutely, that point about alignment of financial incentives, so often we see these things fall apart when we're observing them as the regulator, because that bit, even if the tech works, if the, if the financial alignment and the finance, the benefits realization isn't aligned, you know, no dice. And um, and then finally, data, this, the data connectedness and the interoperability still, that's particularly where you have, often find the financial incentives aren't perfectly aligned between the organization so like, you know, my advice to anyone doing this is it's it's work the soft stuff you know the, the tech's hard and important but, but but that's that's where you kind of need to overemphasize your time your commitment the money that you have to do it because that's where these things tend to fall down Felix I want to just support what you said because <clears throat> pardon me when you were speaking earlier about whether or not these applications really work and what you just said uh, it underlines why so many wonderful solutions don't or fail in the end not because they weren't great applications, not because they weren't good solutions, but because of a lack of data interoperability, a lack of business alignment. You're absolutely right. 
Excellent. Thanks all. So there was a, a question from the audience that I, I think we were just actually answered, uh, which is great, um, uh, which was around this kind of trust issue. Um, uh, and yeah, I'll just read some of it. I love the way that you brought together stakeholders from such important sides of the AI business and clinical settings. My question relates to the issues of trust. Specifically, could the hesitancy around adopting AI in more sensitive settings be related to famili familiarity and might this be resolved over time? The research consortia have observed over the years a transition from an emphasis on app and tool development to implementation, where the number and type of implementations have been expanding. A big part of the expansion has been stakeholder engagement, relationship and trust building, and these all require time. Um, so thank you for that question and comment. Um, and I think it addresses some of the questions that some other people brought up about what are the challenges of co-developing devices and data and tools as well. Um, okay, let's find another let's find one more it's um um okay so there's ones that are quite broad here so i might have to um uh they're, they're either quite broad or incredibly specific um let's see what we're going to go for for like a final question from here um ah okay so this is, this is an in you know, we probably won't have time okay well let's so let's just i mean i think i i think we've touched on the kind of equity issue um and i think one thing that uh you know, occurred to me during this conversation is that, uh, you know, equity kind of is kind of commonly and correctly understood as like, you know, trying to improve fairness, right? Uh, the dis a fairer distribution of gains and particularly uh, some form of specific attention to those that are margin that, that unfairly have, have uh, worse health experiences and worse health. Um, but also, I think it's definitely worth reflecting. I think it's probably obvious to, to all of us here, but I think it's an important point to say more generally. Uh, we're operating in a situation where there's this inverse relationship um, between essentially, well, people with uh, higher levels of clinical need also have much more complexity and much less access to healthcare services and also technology. Um, so that's the operation, that's the area that we're operating in and that we're all trying to solve for. And what that means very specifically is that data that is used to train algorithms is generated from that system operating in that way. And that really compounds the challenge of trying to address this with these technology-based solutions. And I think, you know, we kind of all discussed it, but I wanted to kind of make a double kind of click point on that. And it makes uh, implementing machine learning to improve equity incredibly challenging um, over and above the things that were said. I was just wondering, you know, does anyone else have any reflections um, on that? Um, I'll just <clears throat> I'll just add to that because what you just said is absolutely correct. It, it, we have a data problem when it, when it comes to health equity and particularly in these regulated industries where it's very difficult to bring the data sets together to, to create that kind of data uh, training set. But then at least uh, in the US, we also have a problem with uh, closing the gap between those systems and the resources and services at the ground level, at the individual level to ensure access to care, which are largely still manual, not digital. And to build those connections are also very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do, do, do any of you have a final kind of comment? Otherwise we can sum up any thoughts. I, I would agree and add that I think that this isn't all of the solution, but some of the things that we are thinking about are building patient trust even with sharing the kind of demographic information we need because that's one of the areas where we found we had a gap is that the people who opt out of sharing those things with us in our data set in the first place even if they are having contact with our system are the exact people that we're concerned are going to be missed by the algorithms and then on the flip side what lisa brought up about just resources is thinking more proactively about do we need to provide devices to people do we need to provide locations in the community where you can go and do a telehealth visit but close to your home so you don't need to come downtown and park how do we ensure there's a hot spot or connectivity in the home for our patients who need it most and those are not things frankly that health systems know how to do or have done in the past so you know thinking again about do we build it ourselves or partner this is one of those areas where we're looking potentially to partner with others who have figured out these types of, of logistical challenges to make sure that we have those things available for patients. Excellent. Titch, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would uh, just emphasize what uh, Felix uh, alluded to earlier, that technology is only a part of the solution and uh, that in and of itself alone is not enough. So as we think about technology, we also wanna think about everything else that uh, is interdependent. <laughs>
including the politics, the policy, you know, the society, education, you know, I, I could go uh, on and on, but uh, I, I, I want us to encourage ourselves that as we talk about technology, we don't forget that technology doesn't exist in a, in a, in a vacuum. Excellent point. Felix? No, I mean, uh, what he said, what they all said. Um, but my, my plea is yes. when you're demonstrating or testing these things out, try and, you know, take it to the patients that need it the most. Use their data, or, you know, with appropriate consents and all of those things. But, but you know, don't just rely on that first data set it came from, from a population a long way away that doesn't look or feel anything like your population. So think about how you can do it. Test it with, the, with, with your local population or build things that work, because, um, you know, you and your local population know themselves the best. So you kind of got to take, take, like, take the science to them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. So, everyone, uh, I know we're we're kind of at time. So, if you just indulge me for a, um, another couple of minutes, I think. Um, okay. So, firstly, I mean, thank you all for joining. Uh, amazing panelists, um, all of you out there in the audience, uh, wherever you are, and you're in many different parts of the world. We really appreciate you joining us for this. Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, I have to say, you know, these are all just remarkable people and I feel like incredibly grateful that I know them and that we all get to hear what they have to say. Um, I hope you've been taking notes. I have. And uh, this will be available on YouTube. So be available to watch again, obviously, for anyone else to watch again as well. Um, and yeah, I hope you're kind of convinced here that like there is an art to applying these technologies. Um, and um, it's through getting more people familiar with that art and what the issues to solve are and why they need to be solved that we're really going to push um, this industry forward. And by this industry, really what we're talking about here is uh, the highest level of health gains and the fairest distribution and the sustainability therein. And this set of technology tools is um, yet another vector and there'll be more coming uh, in the future, of course, as well to help us achieve that, but it's very much within that mission. So, you know, just to kind of summarize this, um, if you want to find out more about this area, then we'll, we will share some links uh, around the paper that Felix discussed, the previous discussion, the, 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 we'll be sharing this as well. If you want to, I guess, connect with us, we're all on LinkedIn, some are on Twitter under um, uh, uh, our names. Um, and, um, so yeah, feel free to kind of add us on that. I think, you know, the, the mission of this is really just to get, these all totally free, of course, we're all kind of doing it voluntarily. The schools are um, helping us organize this voluntarily as well, because we really believe that kind of spreading this art of applying technology well in healthcare is something that's important if we're going to uh, realize the potential of these technologies and, and avoid the uh, perils or the dangers. Um, but you know, we'd really like to you know we'd really we'd like to interact with you more afterwards as well. We haven't had the chance to answer all the questions. Uh, I think we probably will go to introducing some kind of Discord so we can have like a broader discussion um, afterwards. That will be coming. Uh, I don't know at some point soon. <laughs> I don't want to commit to a specific uh, point in time, but stay tuned for that. But if you uh, follow me on LinkedIn, then I'll post the links to this stuff and if you could comment if you've or if there's any feedback for us either comment there or there'll be subsequently a feedback form and it really helps us kind of put this stuff together the next discussion is going to be focused on life sciences um another massive area uh and it will be of a similar similar kind of nature it will probably be in september um for a number of different non-technical reasons let's call them that um uh, and yeah like please join us on that but uh, but until then you know thank you all for joining uh Thank you to Titch, thank you to Elaine, thank you to Lisa, and thank you to Felix and to um, Susan and the HBS Alumni Association, and also to David, Amelia, and Mario uh, at HSPH. And um, yeah, have a good day.